Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. As we read responsibly the call to worship. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing, sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. Let us pray. <coughs> our Father and our God, we come this morning with thankful hearts. We come with praises and adoration. We praise you for your faithfulness, for your love, for your forgiveness, for healing our lives. We praise you for waking us up this morning. And this morning we have another chance to fellowship one with another and to join in corporate worship. We give you thanks for your enabling for our physical strength and for the wisdom we need to meet all the challenges of life. We pray that this morning with humility we will place our hands in your hand. Trust you and seek your will for our lives. In the midst of life, inevitable disappointments, heartaches, discouragement, and sicknesses, we trust you. And we come this morning asking you for forgiveness for our sins. And we praise you this morning for sending Jesus Christ as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So that we may experience forgiveness and reconciliation through him. We thank you for the invitation. For if we confess to you, you are faithful and just, and you will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. First John 1 verse 9. We pray upon the authority of your word, the indwelling of your spirit, and the leading and prompting of your spirit, to which we submit. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. The scripture reading this morning will be from Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land 
that I should not destroy it, but I found none. And the second reading from Hebrews chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such a high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. Amen. Amen. Spirit to continue. Maybe I was hard on you last week, huh? Hard mm -hmm. on myself too. I've always preached first to myself. You should know that. 
and, uh, uh, and it's the church, the church in general, not just our church, but the church and the spirit can't be wrong in his leading. I just read the Ezekiel passage one more time and just one verse for emphasis. I look for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it. But I found no one. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy. I pray this morning that you would lead us in your perfect will. Give us wisdom, give us understanding. Bless this word to our hearts, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Just to recap a little of what was said last week, uh, when we talk about standing in the gap, we are really talking about taking the place of somebody else. It could be um, a fallen defender, it could be a supporter. In fact, it could be standing in place of a family, a relative, uh, a community person before God. It, it could mean uh, pleading with God to have mercy pleading with God for his intervention on behalf of others. And I said that in the scripture we have a, a number of persons who stood in the gap between God and the people. And it was always a situation where the nation sinned and they were unrepentant. And God called persons to proclaim his, his desire and his purpose for the people and, and what he would do if um, the, the, the nation did not repent of their sin. And we, we, we talk about two prophets. We talk about Ezekiel, who wrote strong warnings of judgment and also words of encouragement to the people. But they would not repent. And we talk about other prophets like Jeremiah who, who stood in the gap also uh, between God and the people and as far as both prophets were concerned they, they, they searched the nation for persons who were willing to stand between this righteous God and and the people and, and said none, none was found. But the prophets they were called by God but they, 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 we didn't have enough prophets. We didn't have enough persons and, and we need to understand it, it was not just to stand for people but they were standing between a holy God and the sinful people. And you need somebody to be that bridge between a holy God and an unrepentant people. And, and there weren't many people to be found. 
with the exception of a few prophets, who themselves had problems. And, and um, we didn't have time to talk about uh, kings who were involved, but one king who was involved in, 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 in that situation was, was Hezekiah. And he, he is known in scripture as a righteous king. And, and he brought about um, some kind of reformation within his kingdom which I would make slight reference to as we proceed. And I, I said, ultimately, God found somebody who could stand in the gap between himself and the unrepentant people. And it was a reference to Jesus, God finding himself. Uh, giving up himself, his, his son, because Jesus was, was God and still God. Um, it's just that he took on humanity, he took on flesh, he became incarnated. And he was able to stand in the gap between the righteous God and the sinful person. It cost him his life. He had to give his life, ultimately for the people. And come that they might have light and have it in all its abundance. <coughs> and I would say that Jesus was all in. He was fully engaged as God and as man. And I made three points, I want to make three points and I was only able to make the first one, that God is still calling people to stand in the gap because wickedness is still in the land. Last night, you might have heard about the mass shooting in LA mm -hmm. where people are having a good time in a ballroom. There are other things happening there which we don't have all the facts at this point. But these people are minding their own business, celebrating their whatever they were celebrating. And somebody went in there with a gun and killed 10 people on the spot. And there are 10 people now in hospitals struggling uh, for their life. It's like every week there are murders. And, and um, both Ezekiel and Jeremiah talk about shedding of innocent blood. Looks like the more things change, the more things remain the same. So God is still searching for individuals, for Christians, for men and women who would stand in the gap and plead and pray. The current state of our nation is frightening. We have blatant destruction of the family, family unit. We have mountains of immorality, racial tension, rebelliousness, the reality of poverty, the rising threat to our individual and corporate security. And I asked you last week to be that man, to be that woman standing in the gap between God and your family, between God and your friends, God and 
our children on college campuses, between God and our towns and our cities, and between God and our church. Picture this. You are the human bridge that connects a sinful society to a holy God. Just picture yourself doing that. And, and there is a sense of urgency needed to reach this world. A sense of urgency. And, and when you walk around, when you walk around, when you walk around, and you look at the, the state of churches, whether locally or otherwise, you realize that, that people who comprise the church largely miss this. They do not see that sense of urgency. The least of people's time today is given to the work of the Lord. And you can see that in church attendance, how it's treated lightly. You just get up in one morning and don't feel like coming to church, and that's it. And there, there is no value and premium that is placed on it. I just upset. And it, it, there, there, there's no, 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 no guilt about it. Well, I thank God for those of you who come Sunday after Sunday. You are building your heavenly account. There is often a, 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 a lot of a sense of urgency that flows from the reality that there's always a soul to be saved. There is that, we, we, we miss that sense of reality that life will not always be the same. That there is a difference between death and living. I said last week that it looks like things just continue with no changes that, people, that, that children are always being born. Children are being born every day and people are dying and it looks like that's routine. But the scripture tells us that after death comes the judgment. And maybe the church is missing the opportunity to talk that there is a judgment to be faced, to be encountered, to be experienced. Everybody will be judged by God himself. And, and we're, we're going to be judged on what God requires of us. And that must always be a, a, a part of the message of the church. That you don't live it how you want to live. You don't live anyhow because you're not going to die anyhow. And your eternity will not be anyhow you want it. God has so designed it that we reap what we sow. And, and sometimes this lack of urgency flows out of a theological construct that causes some people to conclude that it is up to God anyhow. Yes, it is up to God, but 
We have, a, we have a responsibility in how we live the years that God has given to us. In how we live the time that God has given to us. In how we use the mouth that God has given to us. How we use the hands that God has given to us. Don't forget the mission and mandate that Jesus left for us all in Matthew 20, 19, when he commissioned his followers to go and make disciples of all nations. Go and make disciples of all persons. And, and you know what else is missing in the church? Is the absence of broken heart for the lost. Where is the brokenheartedness? The prophets would weep over the, the, the unrepentant. The prophets would weep over uh, a sinful nation. Where, where, where are our tears for empty churches? Where is our grief? Where is our grief for, for the unrepentant members of our family? Because if they die outside of Christ, they are going to go to hell too. No matter how nice they are. And we, if we have repented of our sins, and we die, we will go to hell too. No joke about that. That's a reality. We're talking about the absence in engaging in gospel conversation with family, with friends, with neighbors, with others. I know it's easier said than done to go and get involved with other people who are different from us and develop interaction and, and fellowship and relationship with them and invite them to Jesus and invite them to church. And, and another thing that is, that is missing and uh, to a great extent, extent is the amount of time we place on intercessory prayer. How much time do we put in prayer? Pray for the nation. Pray for family members who are not saved. Some people will invest hours in reading a book. Some people will invest hours in watching their favorite television programs. Some people will invest hours in, in telephone conversation. That may involve just gossip. But very little time for prayer. I repeat last week. My people which are called by my name. Will humble themselves. Seek my face turn from their wicked ways. Underscore pray. Underscore turn. Which is repentance. Repentance means you, you, you're going down the wrong path and you turn around. Sin means amatia. It's going the wrong direction. And as soon as you recognize it, you turn around. The Bible says, all oh, have sinned. But we don't have to continue down the path. Because when we pray, we bridge that gap between God and the people. And you know, prayer is it's not ordinary. Prayer is an expression of deep struggle. We, 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 we all struggle 
with things in life and, 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 and a good prayer, you, you, you struggle with God. You, you wrestle with God. You wrestle, you struggle. You have concerns. It's a time to agonize. And you do that because you know it, 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 there is a time coming when when, when you don't have to struggle no more. A, a, a time when the, the struggle will be over. The scripture says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Joy will come. And when you struggle and you see the fruits of your labor, you see so many persons come to know Jesus Christ as their personal savior. And you know all of this are fruits of your, your labor. Well, let me hasten to the second point. Is that standing in the gap requires that we send ourselves on scripture. King Hezekiah, he reigned in a society of a boxing people. But then he called his nation together and he reestablished the scripture as the center of their lives and worship. Second Chronicles 29, verses 25 to 30. So the king, the priests, the Levites, the people all came together and they bowed before God. They repented of their sins. You see, the Bible is the life of the church. It's, it's, the, it's the instructive, it's the authoritative word of God. And, and, and Timothy says, all scripture is breathed by God. And the apostle Paul writes, it is profitable for teaching. Uh, for reproof, reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And I hope that you see how I take the scripture seriously in Bible study and in the, in, in the preparation of sermons. Because scripture teaches us how to pray. Um, it, it teaches us how to, to live our lives. And you see, the Bible becomes the final authority. And we can trust God to work in our lives. Whereas we once focus on other things, once we get to know Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, then the Bible becomes the guide. It becomes our navigational system. It becomes the point of reference. And let me close with this. If we spend enough time in the gap, something will happen. If you stand in the gap, something will happen. And then you have to expect something. In fact, if you stand in the gap during weekdays, uh, Sunday morning when you come to church, you should expect something. What do you expect this morning? Every time you come into the house of God, every time you come for worship, whether it's Bible study, prayer meeting, or the regular service, you should expect something from God. Souls to be saved, lives changed, church transformed. And so we can be a part of the miraculous event of someone receiving Christ as their personal savior. And when we come, we should expect something of an awakening. Something should happen to you. You shouldn't come and you go home the way you came. I don't feel no difference. You, 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 you came in and you spent some time and that's it. You're leaving and boy, nothing happened to you. 
It should be so. You should experience every time you come, you receive a spiritual awakening. And, and more than a spiritual awakening, because a, a, a spiritual awakening is not necessarily a religious awakening. A spiritual awakening is not necessarily a Christian awakening. This awakening happens when Christians recenter themselves on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you see circumstances in light of eternity. You see life through the eyes of God. Get this. For you experience for you to experience a personal religious awakening. You usually don't need to learn new concepts. You need to become more intimate with how great your salvation is. It's free and it's great. Someone says the gospel is like a wall. Well, a well. You don't find better water by widening the well, but by plunging deeper into it. You get deep with Jesus. Some people have a surface knowledge of Jesus. Some people have a surface experience of Jesus. You want it to be deep. You want it to have depth. And what prevents that? Unconfessed sins. Or unconfessed sins. Lack of knowledge of the scripture. This morning, my challenge is that everybody inside this house wants to have a closer walk with God. If nothing else, if nothing else, you want to have a closer walk with God. And, and he is able to save those who come to him through Jesus Christ. And you leave again this week Remembering that you're called to stand in the gap. And this, the words of this song that I'm going to repeat reminds me about Jesus standing in the gap for us. It says, I heard that you were hurting, that you were suffering pain. But I didn't dare turn my head and look the other way out. For when your heart is aching, my heart is aching too. Let me help you bear your burden. That's the least I can do. I'll be standing in the gap for you. Just remember someone somewhere is praying for you. Calling out your name. Praying for your strength. I'm standing in the gap for you. Right now you may be troubled. But everything will work out fine. For the Spirit knows you and knows what is on your heart and mind. So I will be to see you.
Jesus knows, Jesus understands. And he pleads to the Father on your behalf every day. He stands in the gap for you. I want you to put some people on your list. Make a list of individuals for whom you will stand in the gap for them. You will encourage them. You will call them periodically. But every day, you would lift them up before God. And I want you to put your church on the list. That at least twice a day, you will stand in the gap for your church. And pray that God will bring healing, that God will bring about salvation, that God will bring about revival. Amen. 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 Let us pray. Lord Jesus, I'm so grateful for what you have done for us. Thank you for loving us so much and standing the gap for us. Thank you for sacrificing yourself on our behalf and on behalf of all those who come to God through you once and for all so that we don't have to make those sacrifices for ourselves because they would bear no weight. Only the sacrifice of Jesus atones for sin. Thank you for your faithfulness. And this morning our hearts are full of, your, of love for you. Help us notice all the amazing things you have done for us. And forgive us when we get off track or take our focus off you. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you God for calling us yes. to many missions, ministries. Today to stand in the gap. Give us the resolve to walk with you through the dark. And we know that you go with us. Yes. To go with you through the judgment. And praise be to God, you will be with us. Mm -hmm. And thank you that in the end you will give us grace and glory. Hallelujah. Yes, and we will go with you, knowing that our labor will not be in vain. God, those who are gone before us, who are recipient of your grace and glory, will praise you that they never look back, despite the struggles so as we go, we go with you. Now for a while we part, but hope to meet again. And so the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. And give you peace.